This is going to be some basic information you need to know about adrenergic receptors and then some practical tips about uh, medications that we use as vasopressors and inotropes. I've drawn out some of these receptors and it's basically just good to know that you'll have binding of an agonist to this receptor and then it affects some intracellular change. So in the case of an alpha-1 receptor you have calcium release into the cell and the function of these receptors is largely to cause vasoconstriction. Alpha-2 receptors I don't want to say much about because they are not vasoactive. For beta receptors, the end result of an agonist binding is that you have increased intracellular cyclic AMP. I just wanted to point this out because we do use a medication called milrinone, which is an inodilator that works basically like um, a beta agonist or has the same effect as a beta agonist, but it bypasses this receptor by directly increasing your intracellular CAMP. How this works is usually your cyclic AMP is broken down into AMP by phosphodiesterase, but milrinone blocks your phosphodiesterase. Therefore, this doesn't happen and you have increased amounts of intracellular cyclic AMP. So you can see some of these beta-1 and beta-2 effects without actually affecting this receptor. These alpha-1 vasoconstricting receptors are usually postsynaptic and typically in smooth muscles. So they'll be located on these muscle fibers and when you have binding of an alpha-1 agonist to this receptor you'll cause vasoconstriction or contraction of these smooth muscles and then narrowing the diameter of these blood vessels. So this causes arterial vasoconstriction which increases your systemic vascular resistance, your SVR, and it also causes venous vasoconstriction because you do indeed have smooth muscles on your venous capacitance vessels and the end result of squeezing down on these is that you'll increase your preload or you'll assist with your blood returning to your heart. If you have a bunch of venous vasodilation, you can think of this blood pooling in your venous capacitance vessels and not properly participating in circulation. But what you can do by vasoconstricting this is that you recruit this blood volume and you will increase your preload. Technically, you also have alpha-1 in your lungs and you could get bronchoconstriction from this but this is not really something that you see. This is a slice of your heart, so this is your myocardium. And this is an epicardial vessel, which will have alpha-1 receptors on it. So this technically will vasoconstrict a little bit with giving an alpha-1 agonist. Just so I don't lead you astray with this, I don't mean to suggest that the alpha-1 receptors on this epicardial vessel will overall decrease your myocardial perfusion when you have an alpha-1 agonist. In fact, an alpha-1 agonist is often the best way that you have to increase your myocardial perfusion. Remember that your left ventricular perfusion is determined by your diastolic blood pressure which is the pressure in your aortic root that's forcing blood down the coronary arteries and therefore through these epicardial vessels minus the left ventricular end diastolic pressure or the pressure left in this heart chamber during diastole. So sometimes the best way to increase our LV perfusion is to use an alpha-1 agonist to increase our diastolic blood pressure. Our best alpha-1 agonist is phenylephrine, which is a pure alpha-1 agonist. Norepi is also an extremely good alpha-1 agonist, but it also has beta activity. Now looking at beta-1 receptors, most importantly these are found on postsynaptic membranes in the heart. The beta receptors at your SA node 
will increase the chronotropy or heart rate. At the AV node, agonists will cause dromotropy, which is increased conduction speed through the AV node. And then beta-1 receptors on the myocardium will boost your inotropy. If you need a good beta-1 agonist, think epi, dibutamine, isopril, and ephedrine. And ephedrine is a nice everyday beta agonist that we often have drawn up. Beta-2 receptors principally cause smooth muscle dilation. So these are found postsynaptically on smooth muscle and gland cells. In our lungs, of course, this causes bronchodilation. And when these receptors are on blood vessels, we'll get vasodilation, which can help improve myocardial perfusion and also improve skeletal muscle perfusion. It's these subendocardial vessels that tend to have beta receptors on them. And of course our bronchioles have smooth muscles with beta-2 receptors and you'll get bronchodilation from this. If you're looking for a selective agonist of the beta-2 receptors, there's salbutamol, which is Ventolin, used specifically for bronchodilation, but all of these medications that are beta-1 receptors also tend to have some beta-2 activity as well, so they'll cause vasodilation to some degree. I'll finish this off by making a note about this concept of unopposed alpha, which is what happens when you have alpha-1 agonism, so vasoconstriction, without the beta-2 dilation to go along with it. Usually with our endogenous catecholamines, they'll have alpha and beta activity, but in theory, if we take away this beta dilation, we'll be left only with vasoconstriction. So if we look at what's happening in the heart, for example, we said these epicardial vessels have alpha-1 receptors on them, so they're vasoconstricted. And our subendocardial vessels have beta receptors on them, which will give us a little bit of dilation and help with perfusion of the subendocardium. But if we use a beta blocker, we'll knock out this dilatory effect. So the theory is that this causes hypertension and decreased coronary perfusion. Then the same thing happens outside of the heart as well, where you have basically unopposed vasoconstriction. So your heart is pushing against a higher afterload and uses more energy. So the metabolic activity of the heart is higher. And these things could culminate to cause end organ damage from decreased myocardial perfusion and other hypertensive emergency effects, which means that you should be very careful about beta blocking a person who has very high amount of circulating catecholamines. The best example of this is someone with a pheochromocytoma, where you have a tumor that's secreting endogenous catecholamines. More recently, the actual clinical significance of this has been questioned. And perhaps the risk of unopposed alpha is overstated. However, 
this does remain as a dogmatic concept, so you should be aware of this, and someone would certainly be within the norm of practice to avoid beta blocking someone without having some amount of alpha blockade on board. So typically for these FIOs, you would start by alpha blockade, and then you would beta block them once you have their blood pressure down a little bit.